Welcome to Trench Diaries. Iron Coffins, Part 6. Wiesner reacted promptly, calling out, Captain to the bridge. Paulson arrived, let out a heavy sigh through his beard and issued a string of commands. The alarm shrieked. We all jumped down the hatch, U-557 cut into the waves and within 20 seconds she had submerged. As the boat balanced out, the crew hustled on to battle stations. Periscope death, the captain demanded. U-557 went up to the designated depth. The XO climbed into the tower while I assumed the helm. The humming noise of the periscope motor filled the small room and the captain was quite comfortable with the periscope and smoothly moved it up and down between the rise and fall of the rough seas. The operator on the underwater microphones reported that the convoy was approaching fast. Soon we heard the grinding of a multitude of screws with our naked ears. The sonarman then detected an escort group ahead of the convoy. The throbbing noise of turning screws covered the entire westerly horizon. Then we heard the sharp, metallic ping-ping of the astic impulses that the destroyers sent out to detect submerged vessels. It was a brand new experience for most of us on board. It sounded like a large tuning fork striking the hull. The noise then traveled through the boat, escaped the other end and spread across the depths of the Atlantic. Meanwhile, the low thumping knock of many piston engines and the chirping song of turbines grew louder steadily. The sonarman reported that the convoy had turned in a southerly direction. Then, suddenly, we distinguished the fast rotating propeller of a destroyer. The captain, turning the scope around quickly on its axis, called out, Three destroyers, bearing 320, distance 3000 meters, full left rudder, new course, due south. We could have attacked the menacing destroyers, but Paulson wisely chose bigger and safer game. Soon he cried out, What a view! Rig all five tubes for firing. Target speed 10, angle on bow left 30, depth 7 meters, range 1200. Hey EXO, take a look at this parade. Can the EXO bent forward and pressed his forehead against the rubber cushion of the eyepiece. Then he gasped. There are at least 30 of them, they're rocking like elephants. The captain resumed his circular sweep, but before long he let out a surprised gasp and retracted the scope. Both engines ahead emergency, he shouted. Die fast, chief. Bring her down. Level off at 150 meters. Quickly. The screws churned widely. The boat started to vibrate strongly and plunge down towards the ocean floor. Prepare for death charges. The nerve-wracking swish, swish, swish of an approaching escort grew louder, drowning out the groaning noise of the 30-odd cargo ships. But the destroyer crossed our track astern and then hurried away into a northeasterly direction. The chief gradually brought U-557 up again to periscope depth, a maneuver that took almost 20 minutes. Meanwhile, the convoy had zigzagged again and a quick sweep with the scope told Paulson that he was in a disadvantageous position, too far north for a perfect shot. At 21.15, with darkness only a few minutes away, Paulson decided to wait until dark, then surface and seize the convoy from his turn. In the conning tower, foul weather clothes were handed out to the attack watch, whose members made ready to mount the bridge. Thirty minutes passed in silence, with the captain still hunched over the scope. Then, the sonarman reported that the convoy had zigzagged again. The noise of many piston engines and throbbing propellers, magnified by the clear ocean water, made our hearts race. It was now 22.45. Paulson jumped off his seat and commanded, blow all tanks. As U-557 broke surface, Paulson flipped the lever of the hatch and flew up the ladder. Five of us followed him onto the bridge. The night was moonless and black, which made it perfect for the attack. The boat lay low, her deck awash. U-557 gained speed and searched after the targets. I see a shadow bearing 2-5, distance 5,000, a lookout reported. I see multiple shadows bearing 3-5-0, called another. We had the convoy dead ahead and gradually closed the gap. Gently, Paulson put the boat in a position 300 meters astern of a freighter. Incredibly, there were no escorts. Apparently they were searching in the wrong direction. Now, the wolf was in the middle of the flock of sheep. Both engines ahead one third, shouted Paulson. Then to the XO he said, listen, I am going to steer between the two columns. You take one shot at one ship. Take the farthest and fattest target first, the nearest last. Shoot to both sides and aim dead center for the smokestacks. 
Our distance from the shadowy monsters ranged from 400 to 700 meters. It was a stunning situation. Sailing undetected amid an armada of enemy ships, selecting at leisure the ones which had to go down. The XO went over all the target values multiple times, making sure they were correct. Angle right 70, distance 500, speed 11 knots. The captain shouted into the wind, weapons free XO, let him have it. Sorry to break the tension, uh, but I will pause the story at this point, uh, because once again the English book deviates substantially from the German original. Um, in the German version the attack gets called off at the last moment via radio message from High Command. Um, U-557 falls back and gets detected by the escort destroyers, which is where the story will continue in a few moments. Um, I have translated the events as described in the original version to match this narrative. Um, in the English version the EXO lets off all five fish, three of which are scoring hits and sinking the corresponding freighters. Um, after reloading all the tubes and only then do they get detected and are forced off. So I didn't know which version to believe, so I pulled out my trump card, which is the actual war diary of U-557, which is public domain. Um, I will put it on screen, um, just so you know all the war diaries that survived the war are public domain and can be accessed online. And in this war diary there's absolutely no mention of a convoy engagement um, during this time frame. So I think it's certain that it did not happen, and in fact, Paulson makes note that he still has his full complement of torpedoes and is planning to refuel at sea. Again, I have no idea why the English translation does this, but it's the second time it has happened. Um, but at least this time the manner of attack is plausible and the tactical approach is true to historic accounts. So, on with the story. My eyes were glued to the binoculars. If only the EXO were to actually let loose the fish, he was guaranteed to score at least one hit at this distance. Suddenly Cybolt's blonde scalp appeared in the hatch. He shouted to make himself heard above the storm. Sir, urgent radio message from headquarters. Mach schnell, man, was ist denn? Quickly, man, what is it? The message said, U-557, do not attack further. Transmit beacon signals, keep contact until further orders. For heaven's sake, Paulson cursed through his teeth. The order forced us to play a waiting game until our beacons had brought other U-boats to share our prey. Angrily, he ordered our speed reduced. U-557 fell back to the end of the columns, then headed north-northeast using the dark horizon as cover for our escape. But as I routinely scanned the forward sector, I saw a shocking sight. To our port, just 1000 meters away, a destroyer was bearing down on us fast, her bow raising a white mustache of waves. Two other escorts followed at a short distance. For a moment, my tongue was glued to the roof of my mouth. Finally, I managed to shout, Destroyer, bearing 340, angle on bow zero. Paulson reacted without hesitation. Right full rudder, both ahead, three times emergency. U557 swayed and listed while swerving in a bold arc. Then she ran away westward at maximum speed, straight into the onslaught of the waves. The three attackers, now astern, rocked strongly in the foamy sea, their bows dipping deep into the waves their keels showing as they rode high up the crests. But despite this, they were closing the gap. I kept staring at them as if I alone had the willpower to hold them at bay. If we could only speed up by one or two more knots, we eventually would be able to lose them. The diesels hammered loudly, the boat vibrated strongly, but, as I realized with sudden chill, they were still gaining. The captain's cry cut into the night. We plummeted down the hatch, through the tower and onto the deck plates. Paulson shouted above the commotion. Down to 170 meters. Down into the basement. Fast! As the chief bellowed into his microphone, the captain reversed our course. We swung towards the destroyers, even as they rushed towards the foamy wake of our descent. In our frantic effort to undercut the attack, U-557 nosed down toward the ocean floor at a sharp angle. But her stern still hung dangerously close to the surface. The escort's swishing propellers came menacingly closer and every man looked upward in expectation of the inevitable. Then came a terrific explosion. A giant force lifted U-557 by the stern and shook her violently, slamming the crew to the floor plates and throwing the boat into darkness. A second detonation burst moments later. Low rolling thunder followed. The chief shouted, rig emergency lighting, blow tank 3, full rise on the planes. 
Some lights flickered. The impact of the well-placed depth charge spread had forced the boat down to 185 meters, but the chief had kept her well under control. It was the fastest dive he had ever made. Paulson ordered us to keep quiet. He spoke in a low voice, almost whispering. Rig for silent running. Port motor, 70 revolutions, starboard, 60. All auxiliary motors were stopped, all unneeded instruments were shut off. U-557 floated at an incredible depth, completely without noise. Then came the report from the sonarman. Target in 120. Second target in 225. We did not need the sound operator to tell us what was happening on the surface. Asdic pings hit our hull like arrows. The destroyers above us set themselves up for a new barrage. We heard their pumps and their auxiliary motors. We even heard one of the Tommies accidentally drop a hammer. For a moment, all three ships had stopped. Then, one destroyer started her turbine, threw her propellers into high gear and began her run. The swishing noise was accompanied by high-pitched astic impulses that penetrated the steel plates and hit every man's heart. As the destroyer crossed over our boat, we heard one, two, three distinct splashes. Depth charges. Three deafening explosions astern to our port side. The boat moaned under the impact, then shook off the assault with a violent shudder. At once, a second pursuer began her assault. Both engines ahead full, yelled the captain. Hold your breath, men! Three more unrelenting detonations. U-557 trembled, deck plates jumped up, compressed air hissed, but the boat remained watertight. The latest spread had exploded astern to starboard. It seemed that the hunters had no clear picture of our exact position. The high seas and our extreme depth had saved us. U-557 slowly and gently floated away, leaving the destroyers far astern. For three hours we kept up our silent running and the destroyers continued exploding their charges. Then Paulson reckoned we had put a safe distance of about 5000 meters between us and the hunters. At 0500 U-557 surfaced and fresh air streamed into the hull. The night was still black. We proceeded eastward with one diesel full ahead while the other recharged our depleted batteries. The navigational watch took over. We had escaped the hunter-killer group and resumed our pursuit of the now vanished convoy. Shortly after dawn on May 27th, our radio operator received an urgent directive from U-boat headquarters. It said, Emergency! All U-boats with torpedoes to proceed at once and at full speed toward Bismarck, Grid Square, BE-29. Paulson was given the decoded message on the bridge at 0635. By then, the order was some eight hours old. It had first been issued at 2115 the previous evening, while we were submerged and unable to receive it. Since we'd been under attack most of the night, we had no idea of Bismarck's predicament. But we guessed that the battleship must have run into a superior enemy force after her companion ship, Prince Eugen, had been diverted. Paulson was visibly torn. Should he continue to chase the convoy or hurry to help the big ship? Bismarck's position was more than 350 miles southwest of U-557, way too far to be reached in a day. While Paulson worked toward a decision, we intercepted a signal from U-556. The message said that Bismarck was engaged in a losing battle. This forced the captain to turn immediately toward Bismarck's last reported position. We did not realize it at the time, but as U-557 raced southward, two enemy battleships, one aircraft carrier, two cruisers and a number of destroyers had converged on the distant battlefield and were delivering the coup de grace to the mightiest ship afloat. The ocean went high, the wind swept hard and showers cut into our faces. At 0925, we sighted two escorts and had to make a half-hour detour. But our mission had already become obsolete. At 11.50, we received from headquarters this sad message. Bismarck, victim of concentrated enemy fire. All U-boats in vicinity to search for survivors. All night and the next morning, we raced southeast through quieting seas toward Grid Square BE-65, where Bismarck had fought her last battle. We arrived over her grave at noon on May 29, 1941, two days and seven hours too late. The water was calm and covered with a heavy layer of oil and debris. While the regular watch surveyed the sea and the sky for the enemy, a few of us scanned the flotsam for survivors. We found none. Not a corpse, not a single raft or life preserver. We searched the area for a full day and then turned back toward the northern convoy routes.